All right, good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm Jean Morrison, and as the University Provost and Chief Academic Officer, it's my great pleasure uh, to welcome and to join you for this inaugural Elie Wiesel Memorial Lecture at Boston University. I want to thank all of you for being here tonight, alumni, students, faculty, friends, and members of the public. You sanctify Professor Wiesel's memory by your presence here tonight, taking part in the kind of contemplative, lasting, and hopeful discussions that were a hallmark of his life and tenure at Boston University. Before we continue, I want to give special recognition to Nicole Menzenbach, Council General of the Federal Republic of Germany to New England, who is with us tonight. I want to, of course, recognize our featured speaker, Dr. Jute Frievert of the Max Planck Institute for Human Development, who is among the world's foremost experts on the history of emotions and contemporary European history. We're in for a remarkable lecture tonight and the continuation of a grand tradition begun by the scholar that we honor. For nearly 40 years, Boston University had the great fortune of being the academic home of Nobel laureate, author, Holocaust survivor, voice of conscience, and teacher extraordinaire, Professor Elie Wiesel. Every fall, Professor Wiesel would attract a diverse audience of students and faculty for three very special encounters with the great figures of the Bible, the Talmud, and the Hasidic masters. Professor Wiesel himself was a masterful storyteller who used his moral authority to draw connections between the world of Jewish literary imagination and abiding questions of humanity that concern all of us. The Elie Wiesel Memorial Lecture that we launch this evening will offer the campus community and the wider Boston area public the opportunity to hear internationally renowned speakers on subjects ranging from the Bible to modern Jewish thought, literature, history, and politics. Each year, these lectures will embrace the, an overarching theme. The inaugural Fall 2018 Elie Wiesel Memorial Lectures are devoted to the memory of Kristallnacht 1938, a German government-sponsored act of mass violence against the Jews that heralded the destruction of Euro European Jewry. As we mark the 80th anniversary of that November night, the night of broken glass, these lectures will provide an opportunity for us to both revisit what happened and to draw critical lessons and consider their application to our own time. And to heed what was perhaps Professor Wiesel's most enduring call, to never again be silent whenever and wherever human beings endure suffering and humiliation. We hope that this series will once again convene students, faculty, and the community around themes of wide-ranging interest, just as Ellie's inaugural lectures brought together people of all ages and backgrounds to engage with one of the most eminent voices of our time. I want to thank you all again for being part of this special evening and conversation and for helping to keep the memory of this extraordinary scholar, leader, and friend burning so brightly. With that, it's my great pleasure to welcome to the podium the Executive Director of the Elie Wiesel Center for Jewish Studies at Boston University, Professor Michael Zank. Michael? Thank you, Provost Morrison, for this introduction. Uh, I have very little left to say because you say, said the most important things. As many of you know, uh, Professor Elie Wiesel would have been 90 years old last uh, two weeks ago. And there are those moments when I uh, am on campus and I see a person of a certain height and a certain age and a certain dress and I have these moments and then I realize, no, that's not Elie. Um, but we do miss him. 
And the fact that so many of you came out tonight and uh, uh, the next lecture, October 29, is already sold out, uh, it indicates that I'm not alone, we are not alone, missing Elie Wiesel and his voice here on campus and beyond this campus. Why Kristallnacht? Why, why remember Kristallnacht? Why make it the first theme of this new lecture series, which we hope will continue over the next years and, and, and function as a kind of magnet and as a point for us to come together and think about themes, as Provost Morrison said, that are of significance. Why is Kristallnacht of significance? I can only tell you why it is of significance to me, and I will not tell you the whole story because then very little time would be here for, for the actual lecture. It's important to me because it's part of my family history. Uh, my mother remembers that uh, at Kristallnacht, uh, thugs would throw out uh, furniture out of the window in my grandfather's, her grandfather's apartment, my great-grandfather's apartment in a small village. Um, it, it was also the time when her own father uh, was on a list and he was uh, uh, deported to Dachau, as was her twin brother, who was not on a list, but an overeager policeman saw him at the top of the stairs the next day and said, what are you still doing here? And made sure he would also be deported. Uh, a few months later, when uh, my, my grandfather was uh, released from Dachau because he had been a World War uh, uh, volunteer on the German side. Uh, he made sure to buy two tickets on a children's transport to England. Uh, my mother was on that transport uh, from Frankfurt. My, uh, her twin brother was not. He, it was too late for him to make use of the ticket, but he was at the, at the train station to wave goodbye to his, to his twin sister. Uh, the two never s saw each other again. Kristallnacht is an important turning point in the history of, uh, of, of Germany, of the Jews of Germany, and in the history of a civilized country turning into a, uh, into a mob. Uh, we will hear tonight from Ute Frevert about the emotional, uh, historical side of things. We will hear on October 29 from Omer Batov about the contrast between what happened in Germany uh, in November 1938 and what happened behind enemy lines uh, later on in the uh, uh, time of war. And the last lecture, and you're all invited back to that as well, is November 12th with Mark Hetfield, the uh, uh, president and CEO of HIAS, the oldest Jewish refugee organization uh, in the United States, who will draw the connecting lines between the past and the present. And I hope you will all return for that. But now it is my pleasure to invite uh, my dear colleague, Pina Lahav, from the law school uh, to introduce our speaker. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you very much, Provost Morrison. Um, it is a pleasure and a pri privilege to introduce to you Professor Ute Frevert who will inaugurate the Elie Wiesel Memorial Lectures. I've known Elie for very well, and I'm confident that he would be thrilled to have Professor Frevert inaugurate these lectures, and in particular, to hear her analysis and thoughts of Kristallnacht. For the last 10 years, Professor Frevert served as the co-director of the Max Planck Institute for Human Development in Berlin, Germany. She pioneered the field of the history of emotions and being a wise interdisciplinarian, she also extended her interest to the multiple scientific aspects of emotions. Professor Frevert earned her PhD from the University of Bielefeld in the Fed Federal Republic of Germany. She has a very long list of publications that I will not read to you, including most recently, Historicizing Emotions and the History of Emotions. I met her at the Center for Advanced Studies uh, in the behavioral sciences at Stanford, California. And if you look at her resume, you will see a list of many such centers for advanced studies proudly hosting her as a fellow. Like Elie Wiesel, who as you recall, and as the provost uh, uh, said, uh, won the Nobel Peace Prize, Professor Frevert has al always been uh, active in promoting civic society. 
and uh, as a part of her commitment, has served on many um, uh, public foundation boards in both Germany and elsewhere. Her life project includes the promotion of knowledge and international cooperation across the globe, and her dedication to justice, fairness, and integrity is exemplary. Professor Freder also taught as a professor of history at Yale University between 2003 and 2007, and I was witness to the diligent effort to lure her back to her homeland mm -hmm. so that Germany can continue to benefit from her intellectual power and boundless energy. Let me end this dizzying, dizzying introduction by telling you about two of the many awards that she has won. In 1998, she won the prestigious Leibniz Prize, awarded by the German Research Foundation to outstanding scientists. And in 2016, she was chosen to receive the equally impressive Order of the Merit, Bundesverdienstkreuz, by the... <laughs> <laughs> I made it! <laughs> by the President of Germany. The Order of the Merit recognized the strong impact of her work on modern social, cultural, and political history on the European and international level. Professor Frevert, your visit to Boston University is long overdue. And we are extremely happy to have you with us tonight. Well, first of all, um, thank you very much, my dear friend Pnina, for this dizzying introduction. Listening to her, I, I really felt dizzy. What she, who is she talking about here? Thank you very much, Provost Morrison, for you know, introducing us to the whole um, circumstances of this uh, new series. And thank you so much, Michael, for inviting me to be the first in a row of very, very distinguished speakers. I would actually like to stay and listen to all of them. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's uh, not possible. Mm, I only met Elie Wiesel once in my life, and it was during my years at Yale University. And I remember it must have been kind of 2005, 2006, probably, 2007. Um, he spoke at the law school, and of course, the auditorium was packed, as usual. I found a place, because I was early as a German, uh, <laughs> um, and he talked, and I, I remember that very, very well, because it impressed me. I mean, I'm, I'm born as part of a very critical uh, uh, generation. We first ask, you know, what's wrong about the argument, and then we might appreciate some of it. <laughs> but uh, I was, I, I kind of, I really followed him very, very closely, and with ever more, um, or in a way, uh, because he talked about tolerance and respect. And that was actually the first time that I really reflected on what tolerance meant and what it, you know, who actually was able to practice tolerance. While respect, um, he, at least, uh, Elie Wiesel, and I was completely convinced that he was right, was a completely different attitude, a more kind of horizontal attitude towards one another, while tolerance is, has more of a vertical shift. So I learned a lot. It's still with me. I mean, i now at an age where I forget um, a lot. But this lecture is still with me. And so I feel very, very honored to be able to speak in his um, memory. That was one reason why I um, accepted Michael's invitation to come here uh, without a moment's hesitation. Another reason was that Michael asked me particularly to look at the November program from a history of emotions perspective, which I considered to be an intellectual challenge because I'd never done that before. And last but not least, um, I recalled my own highly emotional memories of November 9. Of course, not November 9, 1938, but um, in seven, 1978, uh, on the 40th anniversary of the program, I had taken part in a memorial march through Hamburg, where I had my first uh, paid job <laughs> in 1978. 
And I vividly remember the intense atmosphere, uh, the deep silence, the burning torches, the shame, the rage shared by both marchers and spectators alike. I also recalled a memorable, memorable, memorable conversation with the historian Hans Mommsen. Hans Mommsen was um, an expert on the history of the Weimar Republic and Nazi Germany. He really kind of paved the way, uh, especially through his work in the 1970s, 60s, 70s, 80s, for a new uh, generation's look at, uh, at Nazi Germany. And he, in this conversation, in a private conversation that we once had, he talked about how the burning synagogue in Marburg had been embedded in his memory. He had just turned eight when his father took him and his twin brother um, to the site of the destruction on uh, November 10, uh, 1938. When I asked him how his father, who had been a, a professor of history at Marburg University, how his father had reacted or how he, rem how he remembered his father's reaction, he uh, contemplated for a while and uh, then um, replied that his father, in his memory, had turned ashen pale and looked paralyzed. And I recalled a third episode from 1989-1990. After the wall fell on the 9th of November 1989, we were all struck by the magic of timing. November 9 really seemed to be a fateful day in Germany's 20th, 20th century history. In 1918, the revolution had forced the emperor to abdicate, and the first German republic was born. Five years later, Adolf Hitler and his followers attempted a coup to seize power in Bavaria. The putsch failed, and uh, it took Hitler another 10 years to reach his goal. On November 9, 1938, the Nazi party celebrated the anniversary of the putsch and organized a nationwide pogrom against the Jewish population. And then came November 9, 1989. Um, and led to the reunification of the East and West a year later. So why not declare November 9 a National Memorial Day? This is how I felt about it and many others too. The date, we argued, could be a reference to both the good and the bad sides of German history, moments of joy and happiness as much as incidents of shame and sadness. It seemed to perfectly reflect experiences in an age of extremes, as Eric Hobsbawm had once referred to the 20th century. In the end, however, politicians decided otherwise. The Treaty of German Reunification confirmed October 3 as the new national holiday, as the day of German unity when, in 1990, the GDR ceased to exist and the East German states acceded to the Federal Republic. Watching all this from afar in February 1990, Elie Wiesel had held ambivalent feelings. As much as he was pleased by the breach of the Berlin Wall, he feared that, quote, the painful history of the Jews in Germany's concentration camps could be lost and forgotten. Reunification is coming at the expense of Jewish memory, Wiesel repeated a few months later, adding that he was, quote, disturbed that the American Jewish community is not more disturbed. Others joined him in his concern that the new Germany would relegate the Nazi era and the Holocaust to distant memory. On the eve of reunification, Abraham Foxman, national director of the Anti-Defamation League, 
Foxman said that he wished he, quote, could share the joy of the German people at their unification, but he could not celebrate, quote, not because of my fear for the future, but because of my remembrance of the past. I will come back to these concerns in the third and last part of my talk and answer the question as to whether they have been validated by what has happened after 1990. But before, let me address two other points. First, the emotional politics of the November program, and second, the emotions it raised among Jewish and non-Jewish Germans. To start with, what do I mean by emotional politics? Isn't politics always emotional, even when it pretends in the Barian style not to be? <laughs> Every time that people discuss the way they want to live together, emotions are heavily involved. How could it be otherwise? The truth of the matter, to quote my dear friend Pnina and one of her favorite expressions, the truth of the matter is that National Socialism didn't even pretend to be non-emotional. They did not want to be sober and pragmatic. Instead, they aimed at being passionate, f fanatic, and ideological, in the sense of being deeply committed to a set of cherished ideas and beliefs. What is more, they wanted to enlist every citizen of the Third Reich for those ideas and beliefs. They never forgot that only a third of the electorate <coughs> had voted for the National Socialist Party in the last free election of November 1932. Even in March 1933, under conditions that highly favored the Nazis, the NSDAP got less than 44% of the vote. Much of what happened later was motivated by the desire to win over the missing 56% of, um, of the population, well, of the population that they were really interested in, of course, um, remembering Machiavelli's advice that it is better to rule through love than through fear. Emotional politics served that very end. Nazi propaganda consciously appealed to people's feelings. At the same time, they tried to whip up those feelings, intensify them, direct them, control them. What the people felt and thought was closely monitored by a dense web of domestic intelligence. Moods, anxieties, dissatisfaction, but also approval, enthusiasm, and expectations were precisely recorded and reported to the security services. The propaganda machine then reacted immediately with a new wave of engaging news and appeals. A good part of emotional politics was done by Hitler himself, staging himself as the leader of his people, both approachable and godlike, with something that he had practiced and improved since the early 1920s. Once he was in power, he could capitalize on these talents, and so he did. His charisma was huge, appealing to men and women alike. But charisma, as Max Weber had pointed out, is a problematic gift. It can wear out once the charismatic leader does not deliver on his promises. People might get disappointed and turn away. During the first years of the regime, the threat was palpable, especially among the old fighters, the millions of stormtroopers. There was a lot of dissatisfaction and complaining that nothing had really changed and material life had not improved. Under these conditions, the regime was facing two choices. 
either use foreign policy to impress and silence the critics or focus attention on internal scapegoats who were held responsible for the hardship. Hitler chose both options. He daringly challenged the neighboring states by dispensing with the Versailles Treaty, and he pointed an accusatory finger at Jews both in Germany and abroad. The state imposed harsh legislation against Jewish Germans, and the party allowed its members to openly harass and intimidate them. Violence erupted long, long before November 1938. Synagogues were set on fire, shops were boycotted, and customers photographed. Shame processions were staged in many towns and cities, targeting mostly Jewish men who went out with non-Jewish women. When Jews complained to the police, they were punished once again. In March 1933, the Jewish lawyer Michael Siegel entered a police station in the center of Munich. He intended to press charges against stormtroopers who had demolished the shop windows of his client. Instead, he was beaten up by SS men and paraded through the streets with a sign around his neck, I will never again complain to the police. Practices and that was actually reported um, to Hitler's great uh, chagrin by the Washington Times. Practices of humiliating and terrorizing Jewish citizens were thus well underway from the early days of the Nazi regime onwards. Some actions like the first nationwide boycott in April 1933 were ordered from above. In most cases, however, local party members felt empowered to act on their own behalf. They were convinced that they were working towards the Führer and complying with his wishes. The regime deliberately connected foreign and domestic policy in order to gain approval. Whenever there was criticism from abroad, concerning the violation of the Versailles Treaty in 1936, for example, the propaganda machine claimed that the international jury was responsible and promised retaliation. In the summer of 1938, when the crisis about Czechoslovakia caused widespread concern regarding an impending war, Jews were again condemned as the real warmongers. Local Nazis in a small village published the following leaflet. In the last critical weeks, the Jew, not the Jews, the Jew, had the firm intention of hounding a part of the peoples of the world into a frightful war. The German nation was to be defeated and obliterated. Millions of people were to be slaughtered and murdered. Towns and villages were to be destroyed. More than hundreds of thousands of German families would have faced unspeakable suffering. That was the will of the Jews. Our unshakable will is, in a short time, Winsbach must be Jew free. Hate speech and fake news like this one had obviously infiltrated many towns and villages, not to speak of larger cities. The ground was well prepared for what followed in early November. A Jewish Pole shot a German diplomat in Paris to draw attention to the ongoing expulsion of Polish Jews from the Reich. The propaganda ministry under Josef Goebbels immediately advised the press to give the assassination, quote, the greatest attention 
and to emphasize that this act, quote, was certain to have the most serious consequences for Jews in Germany. Local riots against Jewish shops, synagogues, and people started right away. When the news broke on the evening of no November 9 that the diplomat had died from his wounds, the party leadership was sitting over dinner in Munich, I showed you the, um, the slide earlier on, celebrating the annual anniversary of commemoration of the Beer Putsch of 1923. Hitler had an intense conversation with Goebbels. Then he left, while Goebbels delivered a fanatical 30 minutes hate speech. It was received, as he noted in his diary, with thunderous applause. Quote, they all immediately dashed to the telephones. Now the people will act. But who were the people? This is a, um, a painting from Charlotte Salomon. Charlotte Salomon was born in Berlin in 1917 into a Jewish family. Um, on uh, 9th November 1938, her father was arrested and taken to Sachsenhausen, a newly built concentration camp. He returned a few weeks later, broken, um, by, by this experience and immediately sent his daughter off to southern France where um, her grandparents lived. And um, she then started in 1941, started painting her own life in more than 700 um, gouache. And uh, this picture is one of those more than 700 um, pictures where he, she tried to tell her own autobiography through pictures. She was then arrested in early 19, no, no, not early, October 1943 and taken to Auschwitz where she was murdered um, shortly after. So here you see the people who um, acted in fact, it was mostly local party members and stormtroopers who had taken the call from Munich and rushed to action. The SS received explicit orders to keep out of the affair, and police should ensure that the program was carried out in an orderly way. They were not to hinder the demonstrations, but intervene whenever German meaning non-Jewish property was endangered. Um, similar orders were given to the local fire brigades. They too should only do their job when fire threatened to spread to neighboring non-Jewish buildings. And so they did. When synagogues were set on fire during that night, when Jewish shops and apartments were raided, families terrorized and men arrested, this was officially attributed to what Goebbels called Volkszorn, the wrath of the people. The minister claimed that it was a spontaneous, a direct, a quasi-automatic reaction. At the same time, he was well aware that this wrath had to be built up and released, as he put it through propaganda. Radio programs, films, and newspaper articles did just that. In his inflammatory Munich speech, Goebbels had also made it clear that the party would have to, quote, organize and implement everything. But, and this was important, it should not, quote, outwardly appear to have instigated the demonstrations. The regime thus tried first to attribute the violence it unleashed not to party members and loyal Nazis, but to the entire nation, whose feelings were purportedly deeply hurt by the Paris events. Second, it interpreted the violence 
as an immediate emotional reaction by that very people. A reaction that, as Goebbels claimed, was utterly understandable and justified. The Führer, the party, and the people were, so it seemed, feeling and acting in unison, emotional politics <coughs> at its very best. Now, how did the Jews see it? 1938 has often been called the year of destiny for German Jews, the year when persecution took a new and radical turn. But was this really so? Examining Viktor Klemperer's extensive diaries, we might wonder. He meticulously noted and commented on each and every incident of anti-Semitism that he witnessed or read about, and he became increasingly depressed about it. As the son of a rabbi, Klemperer had converted to Protestantism in 1912. He was married to a non-Jewish woman and did not consider himself Jewish in a religious or cultural sense. That did not spare him being targeted by the racial policies of the Third Reich. Nevertheless, he insisted on being, as he called it, more German than the Nazis. For him, the 1935 Nuremberg laws that deprived him of his German citizenship were a slap in the face. He also lost his professorship at Dresden University, and he feared being driven out of his home and his beloved garden. The November 9 events were barely mentioned in his diary. For him, this seemed to be just one more step in the direction of driving Jews out of the country, which had been the goal since 1933. Klemperer stayed and survived, protected partly by his marriage, partly by the Allied air raid on Dresden in February 1945, which allowed him to escape. Others finally did what the Nazis expected them to do and left Germany for good. Before November 1938, 150,000 of the 550,000 German Jews had already left, the largest number in 1933 directly after the Nazis came to power. Between November 1938 and September 1939, another 90,000 Jews emigrated. In normal years, so to speak, it had been around 20,000. Those who stayed were mostly too old or too poor to leave. Nearly all of them were later deported and murdered. Thus, they were not given the chance to report on the accelerating pace of anti-Semitic politics. We may assume, however, that to them, the extermination process starting in the fall of 1941 must have felt far more dramatic and painful than anything that had happened before. Nevertheless, for those who left after November 9, 30, 1938, for example, Micah's mother, that very day had made the difference. At least this is how they remembered it shortly after leaving the country. In August 1939, the New York Times announced a prize competition organized by three Harvard faculty men. They asked German emigres to write about my life before and after January 30th, 30th, 1933. More than 250 people responded within the next few months. The great majority were Jews who had left Germany after the November pogrom. <coughs> they unanimously declared that the pogrom provided them with a the final motive to organize their emigration 
something that most had dreaded, considering the manifold difficulties. A date that I never forget, the high point of Hitler's Jewish policy, the preceding sufferings, privations, humiliations, and horrors cannot be compared with what happened on this single night. It was generally recognized that the situation was coming to a head, but what happened in November was worse than we ever imagined. Such were the quotes from those who wrote about their lives before and after 1933. Although they expected things to become worse, they had no idea, no imagination of what was to occur on November 9. And just to remind you of the figures, um, more than 30,000 Jewish men were arrested and taken to concentration camps. Around 400 were murdered or committed suicide. More than 1,400 synagogues were um, in flames, Jewish cemeteries destroyed. Thousands of shops and apartments were raided and damaged. Having witnessed and lived through this ordeal, Jews vivi vividly remembered the fear that they had felt, the utter desperation about being completely helpless and at the mercy of Nazi thugs. They wrote about the police standing by or even participating in the destruction. They wrote about the fire brigades watching how synagogues were burned to the ground. They were, in short, devastated and had lost all hope that there could be a future for Jews in the German racial state. Even Klemperer now felt an urgent desire to leave Germany for the US, something that he had always uh, discarded before. Reading these reports and recollections on, on how German Jews experienced the pogrom, I was particularly interested in finding out what they had written about their non-Jewish neighbors, friends, and colleagues. How did they perceive their behavior? Interestingly, there was a marked tendency in the reports to distinguish between Nazis and the others. Many authors actually mentioned that police officers, quote, when alone with their Jewish prisoners, repeated apologetically that they had had nothing to do with these monstrous and disgraceful acts. But after all, that was how they earned their living. A man who had been interned after the program in a fire brigade training school told that, quote, the firemen had acted properly, and in some cases, even generously. The real culprits were identified as brown shirts, stormtroopers, Nazi party members, as well as SS men in the concentration camps. They were depicted as cruel, sadistic, and extremely violent, and as people who enjoyed, who thoroughly enjoyed terrorizing and humiliating others. The violence was not just instrumental. Instead, it was pleasurable, sheer fun. Perpetrators made fun of their victims. They mocked and ridiculed them in a way that was reminiscent of earlier Sharivari-like performances. See this report from Vienna. They the stormtroopers and other Nazis, made me take off my winter coat and wait. Soon, a man came back with my coat. Both arms had been cut, half cut away. Then we were made to march down the street in rank and file and with our inside out coats. I noticed that other prisoners' trousers <coughs> had been cut short and their coattails cut away. We were taken to the police station where a large crowd th shouted threats. When one of the guards saw our strange get-ups, he asked what kind of farce we were playing and ordered us to put our coats back on in the usual way. 
suddenly one of the SA men there ordered me to clean his boots. I was ordered to clean them with the tail of my overcoat and then with a the silk lining. I rubbed as hard as I could. Finally, he let me go unharmed. Such demeaning and degrading acts were meant to demonstrate the Jews' utter powerlessness. They were made to feel that they were at, at the absolute mercy of their masters, who were not prepared to show mercy, but used every means to deprive Jews of their human dignity and self-esteem. On the part of the perpetrators, such politics of humiliation served the end of strengthening their own power and confirming their sense of superior status. Politics of humiliation, however, need an audience. This audience was provided by others watching or participating in the act. Those others were, on the one hand, Nazi party members or police officers, and, on the other, Jewish men who suffered a similar fate. But what about the bystanders, the wider public, the crowd that the Viennese um, witness was talking about? After all, many events took place in, bare, in broad daylight for everybody to see. Even the nightly acts of destruction and violence had not been committed without spectators. When synagogues burn and apartments are noisily demolished, neighbors, friends, acquaintances are bound to see and hear. Reports about their reactions are ambivalent. Some people were helpful and compassionate, others not. Some tried everything they could to ease the situation and console the victims. Others kept their distance and looked the other way. But again, this was not a new experience. Social relations between Jewish and non-Jewish Germans had become strained and problematic after 1933. Klempera was a good example and a careful chronicler. <coughs> he reported on the growing anti-Semitism around him, but mainly in institutions like students and professional associations. At the same time, he also noted visits of sympathy by colleagues and friends. Even those, however, who declared not to be anti-Semites found it necessary to draw a line between Germans and Jews. In June 1935, Klemperer wrote that many otherwise well-meaning people seem to make their peace with Hitler. Their judgment, when he re-establishes Germany's power at the price of domestic regression, it's worth paying the price. Later, one can make up for the injustices. More and more Aryan friends and colleagues stayed away and avoided contact. Still, Klemperer rarely experienced what he called wild anti-Semitism. As late as March 1940, he reported, for my part, I encounter much sympathy among shopkeepers, neighbors, etc. People help me out, but of course, they are fearful. Fear definitely played a role when non-Jewish Germans severed or minimized their ties with the Jewish population. Those who still frequented Jewish shops were often photographed and publicly exposed. Housemaids in Jewish families were put under pressure to quit and seek new employment, and many did. Women who burst into tears when they saw the destruction after the pogrom were publicly criticized. On November 10, the notorious Julius Streicher, Hitler's most powerful man in Lower Bavaria, gave a public speech in the center of Nuremberg. But we know, he said, quote, that there are also people among us who have sympathy for the Jews, people who are not worthy of living in this city, not worthy of belonging to this people of which, of which you are a proud part. 
Even if citizens felt, still felt sympathy and compassion for the Jews, they were more and more reluctant to openly show it. Among those who sent in their life stories in 1939, several mentioned that, quote, so many friends sooner or later turned their backs on us. We had the feeling that they were not at first entirely convinced that what they were doing was correct, but they gradually changed their minds. They learned that the party's recipes were the right ones for the German <laughs> people and the fatherland. It was very painful for us to see and feel this." End of quote. Some thought that November 9 vastly accelerated the process. Now, quote, Jews were avoided even by Aryans who had not previously done so. Others, however, emphasized that all decent people were appalled by the pogrom. Some observed what they called a vexed uneasiness, an unmutiges Missbehagen. Some reported on, quote, a deep feeling of depression and shame that gripped the public. A journalist from Vienna wrote, quote, I have not found a single person who approved of these events, but many who were filled with the deepest revulsion. <coughs> After I had been robbed of everything and stripped of all my assets, a large number of Aryan acquaintances made what amounted to condolence visits to me, brought me gifts, offered me money, and helped me in every conceivable way. They were all ashamed and deeply depressed. There were Aryan women, still part of the quote, there were Aryan women who said, weeping, we are not to blame for this, forgive us. End of quote. The journalist concluded, for me it's a true satisfaction to be able to testify that even in National Socialist Greater Germany, there are still decent people. There are still good human beings. We might take this at face value, and as a German, I'm tempted to believe him. But as a historian, I have second thoughts. To clarify those thoughts, let us look at another life story. Here, a 45-year-old man writes, at the end of his report. If I constantly emphasize that, with few exceptions, my earlier Aryan friends and acquaintances were good and generous to us right up until our departure, that means that in their hearts, a large part of the German people did not approve or participate in the anti-Semitic pogrom. Were it otherwise, were it otherwise, I could not write these lines today on my way to the land of freedom without concern for the lives of those <coughs> dear to me. Then those unfortunate fellow Jews who are now still having to maintain their miserable existence in Germany would certainly no longer be alive. This is, I think, the crucial point. The belief in the German people's ultimate decency and humanity served an end, or rather, several ends. In the case of the Viennese journalist, it served to uphold the memory of a life that was, after all, not entirely based on illusion. Institutions and politics might fail, but the people were all right. So there was indeed something good to cling to in the new unsettling and dizzying life across the ocean. One's identity was not completely shattered and dissolved. The latter case was different. Here, the person who wrote had not yet arrived on American shores. He was still on the ship from Europe. And the things he remembered 
were very, very recent. And he was deeply worried about those left behind, family and friends who had not yet emigrated and perhaps never would. The idea that Germany was full of fervent, greater Germany in that case, was full of fervent Nazis and Jew haters was under these circumstances deeply, simply unbearable. Counting on the belief that a large part of the German people was decent and good calmed his fears and let him hope that things would not turn worse, which they did. Things did get worse for the Jews who remained in Germany. And most Germans got accustomed to looking the other way when they saw Jews being marched to railway stations and deported eastwards. Goebbels' propaganda machine, which did not stop after November 1938, just oops, think of films like Jud Süß or The Eternal Jew, both released in 1940. The propaganda machine had been working very efficiently. Like, um, oh gosh, no, I'm going to completely. Like anesthesia, as one life story writer stated, even if wild anti anti-Semitism was limited to party members, stormtroopers, and SS men, and not to forget the Hitler youth that had played an inglorious role during the pogrom, even in the absence of open and loud hatred, quiet anti-Semitism was widespread. Or, to put it differently, most people just did not mind what happened to the Jews, and many actually profited from the expulsion in material terms. So we may conclude that the emotional politics of the regime had eventually been successful it probably did not achieve the goal of winning over those Germans who for religious or moral or political reasons were not in love with the Führer. But it taught them an important lesson, or rather two. First, they learned that the regime did not hesitate to carry out its most radical promises and threats. The recipients of its hatred were made to feel the consequences without mercy and without exception. So one could only hope not to be among them. Second, the violent exclusion of Jews ultimately forged stronger bonds among non-Jewish Germans, whether active perpetrators or sad bystanders. The latter, who had passively allowed the pogrom to happen and sometimes felt shame about it, were no less responsible than those who had carried it out. In this sense, Hans Mommsen's father, who had turned pale at the sight of the burning Marburg synagogue, but did not renounce his party membership afterwards, was by no means blameless, and he knew it. Now, let's turn to Elie Wiesel's concern about a possible loss of memories in the aftermath of 1989, my final point. Two points. First, it took a long time for the November pogrom to be commemorated at all and by all, not only by the Jewish community left in Germany. 1978 was actually the first time that broader sections of the public became involved. In Hamburg, I was one of the 8,000 8, 8, who marched with burning torches through the night. The local paper printed interviews with Jewish witnesses and devoted about twice as much space to the events of 1938 than to those of 1918. Public TV and broadcast, public TV broadcast debates, interviews, and documentaries about the event. Many politicians, including Chancellor Helmut Schmidt, had followed the invitation of the Jewish community to attend a central memorial ser service at the Cologne Synagogue. Ten years later, in 1988, things 
had changed again. First, the term Kristallnacht was now um, increasingly getting replaced by Pogromnacht, um, the night of pogroms, reflecting a growing sensibility or sensitivity to language and its effects <coughs> to gloss over, to harmonize, um, to de-dramatize events. Second, the central commemoration now took place in the German parliament. Citizens too were active organizing all kinds of events from memorial plaques and lectures to exhibitions and joint um, religious services. The Hamburg local paper that in 1978 had devoted two-thirds of a page to the commemoration now printed a lengthy series um, over several days. The 1980s had been an intense period of remembering the Nazi past and in particular the Holocaust, with a great many people, mostly young and middle-aged, being engaged at a local level. Those Jews who had emigrated in the 1930s were invited to revisit their former hometowns and many accepted the invitation. Then the wall fell and Elie Wiesel was concerned. Has history proved him right? Has the new Germany taken its distance from the Nazi past and the Holocaust? My answer is no. One proof is the 1998 anniversary of the pogrom. It received, if possible, even more public attention than the 1988 event. The year 2005 saw the inauguration of the Berlin Memorial to the murdered Jews of Europe. In 2013, history students posted an ongoing series of tweets, that's what they do nowadays, <laughs> on what <laughs> on what happened in many places from village to big city 75 years ago. And they had an enormous number of followers. And all these events were bottom-up events, but also bottom-up events supported by institutions at the top. Last but not least, the recent wave of right-wing populism has intensified debates on the Nazi past. While such populism can be encountered all across Europe and the US, Germany takes it particularly seriously. Comparisons with the early 1930s are frequently drawn, with today's refugees appearing as yesterday's Jews. Members and politicians of the right-wing IFD, um, Alternative for Germany, do indeed use language that recalls earlier times. During the past month's riots in Saxony following the death of a citizen that was attributed to re refugees from Syria and Iraq, Alexander Gauland, the leader of the uh, IFD, declared, one can understand the, that people snap after such events. Goebbels, in his press release on November 10, 1938, had spoken about the, quote, understandable outrage of the German people about the cowardly Jewish murder of a German diplomat. So far, so bad. Comparisons are useful in two ways. They highlight similarities, but also differences. Such differences are easy to detect. First, the AFD secures around 10 in Bavaria yesterday to 15% of the electorate, while the Nazi party in the early 1930s reached one-third to two-fifths. Second, the huge majority votes for parties that refuse to collaborate with the right-wingers. Third, the institutions, the ju judiciary, the police, local authorities, schools, universities, institutions do not give in to the populist movement. And fourth, they are closely watched by a critical public 
that is represented by conservative and liberal media alike. So let me finish this lecture on a positive note. Berlin is not Weimar. And the Nazi past has not been forgotten in the newly reunited Germany. Rather, the opposite is true. Recent developments have made it even more urgent and timely to analyze and remember what went wrong in the 1930s and make sure that history will not repeat itself. Thank you very much. we won't have time for questions tonight um, but I hope I see you all back on October 29 and finally on November 12 I want to thank Ute Frebert for a very moving very carefully thought out presentation I think we have a lot to think about going away today thank you so much Ute thank you.